Hi everyone, this is Professor Garhart. I want to welcome you all to uh, our first lesson. And uh, we're gonna start with chapter one. And uh, I've got a PowerPoint that I've got up here that we'll discuss. And then in this video, we're gonna go over uh, our first handout that you'll wanna copy down. And so chapter one is really an introduction to our class. It's a pretty short chapter and uh, it just goes over some of the basic things to get started. So I'm gonna go to our uh, PowerPoint slide and I wanna talk a little bit about anatomy and physiology and what these words mean. So anatomy is the study of structure. So it's going to be the study of parts and pieces. All right. So naming things, you know, naming all the bones of the skull or naming all of the structures of our heart. This is the anatomy part of our class. The anatomy part of our class is really covered mostly in lab. So lab, we're going to be learning all the parts and pieces. That's really all lab is, is parts and pieces. So I just wrote here that it's the science of structure. It involves the relationships revealed by dissections or cutting things apart or observing uh, dissected specimens. It's also involved in imaging techniques, you know, like an MRI scan or a CT scan or an X-ray. We're looking at parts and pieces. Now, to contrast that, we've got physiology. Physiology is the study of how all of these parts and pieces work. So their body functions. So physiology is the study of body function. So, um, you know, in lab, we'll learn all the parts and pieces of the heart, but in lecture, we'll talk about how the heart works. How does it beat? How does the muscles contract? How do the valves open? How it works is our lecture class. Now, it says in, in for uh, this class that we're going to be looking mostly at normal adult physiology. This class is all about normal function, how our heart would normally function. Now we're gonna talk about some diseases and disorders from time to time, but when I give you statistics and things like that, just remember it's gonna center around normal physiology of an adult, all right? And I have to stress that because the normal physiology of, let's say, an infant is going to be different than an adult. Uh, for example, let's, uh, let's just take the heart as an example. Um, you know, a typical healthy adult, we're going to have our heart rate at about 70 beats per minute when we're conscious and awake. An infant will be well over 100. They'll be like 110 or so. And that's normal for the infant. But obviously that wouldn't be normal for an adult. If, if an adult's heart rate was over 100 for an extended period of time when they're at rest, they have tachycardia and something's wrong with them. So what we're going to be focusing on is normal adult physiology. And we also have to remember that, you know, everyone is different. There's genetic and physiological variations that can occur. So when I give you statistics or I give you a number, just remember that it's typical kind of uh, typical adult physiology. All right. Now, to move on into this chapter just a little bit, let's examine some topics of anatomy. So anatomy is really broken into two parts. We can have gross anatomy, which is also called macroscopic. Macroscopic anatomy or gross anatomy is what we're going to be doing in lab this summer. So, uh, you know, observing with your eyeballs parts and pieces. 
So it says structures examined without a microscope. So you can look at, you know, a heart model. You can look at diagrams. And that gives you your uh, gross anatomy, studying the, the lungs or studying the, uh, the eyeball or the ear structures using, using observation. Now, a and P2, the class that you will take after this class, you will be doing a lot of microscopic anatomy where you're actually using a, a microscope to observe cells and tissues. And so if we wanted to, for example, you know, we might study the reproductive system and go over all of the structures on a diagram, that's macro. And then we might use a microscope to look at, you know, sperm swimming or an egg in the fallopian tube. That would be microscopic. So these are just some general topics of anatomy. Um, physiology is kind of the same way. It says it's going to reveal the dynamic nature of living things, how things function. So it says uh, we should consider operations of specific organ systems, organs and tissues uh, to observe how they function. So some examples would be like cell physiology, uh, more specifically, something like neurophysiology. This is something that we'll cover later on in the course where we're looking at how nerves function. You know, how do nerves send electrical signals? Uh, pathology, studying how tissues work. And things like exercise physiology. These are all examples of physiology. Pretty cool. Okay. Now, um, our body is uh, kind of divided into these levels of organization, and our class kind of follows these levels. So if we look at the, the top here, we're going to start off with the most basic levels of organization, and we're going to work our way through into the organ, uh, organism level. So we've got... Uh, to start off with, we've got chemical, which are all the chemicals in our body, you know, uh, the biomolecules such as carbohydrates, fats, lipids, etc., are all chemical. Then our chemicals, our proteins, fats, lipids, you know, uh, carbohydrates, they build cells. Cells then build tissues. We put all these tissues together to build an organ. And then these organs are added to systems. And then the systems are all put together to become the actual organism. And so those of you that are more visually, uh, <laughs> visually stimulated here, see we have the chemical level, the chemicals, Molecules build cells, cells build tissues, tissues build organs, like this is a stomach here. And then we put the stomach with all the other digestive organs, that's a system. And then we put all the systems together to build the organism itself. And so uh, our class is kind of built this way. We are going to start off after chapter one with chemicals and do baby chemistry, kind of a crash course in little chemistry. Then chapter three is a crash course in cellular biology. And then for the rest of the class, we're going to be kind of combining tissues, organs, and organ systems together to see how each function as a part of our body. So uh, these levels kind of outline the way the class is going to be. Now, for the next couple of slides, I just go over some of these organ systems. Some of these we cover in this class and some you would cover in Anatomy and Physiology 2, uh, Biology 210 next semester. So uh, here are our major organ systems. We have our integumentary system, that's our skin. 
that's mostly covered next semester. But our skeletal system and muscular system, both are covered in this class. So we'll, we'll talk about bones and muscles. Then we have this lymphatic system. A lot of people think of the lymphatic system as your immune system. We touch on this a little bit in this class, but it's mostly covered in A&P2. Then our respiratory system and digestive systems. Uh, respiration is covered in this class. Uh, some of digestion is, but most of it will be next semester. Then we've got uh, the nervous system. We spend a good chunk of time in this class on the nervous system. The endocrine system is our glands and hormones. I cover this a lot in first semester, so this class. And then, of course, uh, we'll cover it a lot in A&P2 when you take that class. The cardiovascular system, our heart and blood vessels, we really cover that this semester. Uh, the urinary system and the reproductive system are our last systems. And these are basically covered in uh, a and P2. Uh, I mentioned all of the systems, but you'll get a crash course in all of these systems as you take this class and uh, a and P2. Okay. So these are the systems of our body. And, uh, you know, if you, um, if you think about this, we take all of these systems, we put them together to make the organism. They're not autonomous. They have to work together, obviously. So, you know, the respiration and the cardiovascular system are going to work together. All right, sweet. Let's move on in our introduction here. Um, the next slide is talking about the characteristics of life. So life has a certain set of characteristics. So it says in order to be alive, one must have the following sets of characteristics. We have to have organization. So our body is organized, right? We're organized into those different levels, chemicals, cellular tissue organs etc all life is organized in some manner all life has metabolism metabolism is all of our chemical reactions so living things are going to metabolize they're going to break down chemicals and they're going to build chemicals our body is doing this all the time so our body is building up stuff like you're building muscle and you're, you know, you're growing hair, you're making new skin tissue, but we're also breaking down stuff. So you eat food and you're breaking that down chemically. And so all of these chemical reactions are metabolism. All life has metabolism. All life is responsive. We can respond to our environment and adjust to it. So if it's too bright outside, we can adjust our eyes. If it's too hot, if it's too cold, all life is responsive to its environment. Then all life grows. The fancy word for growth is hypertrophy. Um, you are probably more familiar with its antonym, its opposite, which is atrophy. So atrophy is to waste away, to get smaller. Like if, uh, you know, your uh, arm is broken and you're in a cast, the muscles will atrophy. Well, if you're at the gym building muscles, you're growing those muscles, that's called hypertrophy. So if you see the word hypertrophy, it just means growth. All life grows. Then we have development. All life develops. So all life is going to change over time, whether we're a bacteria, an acorn turning into an oak tree or a human being, we all change over time. Now there's differentiation, which is the change from general to specific. So if you think about it, like an egg, a fertilized egg is about as general as you can get. And then we build this very specific uh, body with all these different tissues. So we have differentiation. We also have morphogenesis. That's the change of shape of tissues. 
So, you know, if you think about a, uh, a baby, an infant, they're going to undergo morphogenesis as they grow up because even though babies do look like us, their tissues are shaped different, right? I mean, a baby is basically a giant head with a torso and little tiny arms. And so when we think about morphogenesis, you've got to think over time that babies, I mean, we grow into our heads, our arms get longer, and we, we undergo morphogenesis as we change the shape of tissues. Think about your grandpa. You know, your grandpa is continuing to undergo morphogenesis as he ages. If you look at a picture of your grandpa when he was your age, he probably looks different now than he did when he was in his 20s, right? This is morphogenesis. Uh, we are changing the shape and characteristic of some of our tissues. And then finally, um, all life reproduces. And there's really two kinds of reproduction. We are reproducing all the time, right? We're building new cells. You're growing new skin cells, new blood cells. You know, your hair is growing. You're repairing damage. Uh, if you skin, you know, skin up your arm on a bicycle ride. So we're undergoing that kind of reproduction versus, you know, creating an entire new organism. So sexual reproduction is a part of this with uh, creating a new baby. But, you know, we're always reproducing every day. You are, you are making about 2 million new red blood cells every second. And so we're reproducing like crazy. So all life meets these characteristics. Now, when you think about this, you're like, well, I can think of, you know, some non-living things that are going to fit some of these categories. And that's true, like, like a mineral. You know, if you have a crystal that's growing, a crystal might grow, you know, it may develop and change over time. But in order to be alive, you have to fit all of these categories. So even though a mineral may grow and develop and be organized, for example, because their chemical structure is very organized in a crystal, they are not undergoing chemical reactions and they can't reproduce. No matter how much you put two crystals together, they're not going to create a, another crystal, right? So in order to be alive, you have to fit all of these categories. Now, there's one exception, perhaps, and that's viruses. Viruses are technically not alive. So I always kind of laugh during this whole COVID thing when they say, kill the virus, because you can't kill something that's not alive, right? What you could do is you, all that sanitizing destroys the virus, but it's not killing the virus because the virus isn't alive. Um Viruses might be the exception to these characteristics of life. They're not really alive, but biologists do study them. And uh, they only become active when they get into a host cell. So they really uh, ever undergo any of these uh, conditions when they're inside a living cell. Okay. So um, the next slide is where we're going to have our first handout. All right. So I'm going to introduce it. And then in our next video, I'm going to go over this um, handout. All right. So our whole class is going to be about homeostasis, essentially. So check out my next video on homeostasis and uh, we'll continue.